Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, it, it's actually my pleasure to start with uh, an introduction to the introduction. Uh, <laughs> so um, let, let me present, uh, uh, we'd like to start off by, by presenting uh, our speaker today, uh, Michael Black, uh, as a winner of the uh, 2018 uh, UBC Computer Science Alumni Research Award. Uh, and so um, these have been initiated as part of the UBC uh, Computer Science 50th Anniversary celebrations. And so by way of context, uh, these are awarded to UBC uh, alumnus uh, for significant and lasting research impact. And so, and so uh, Michael is, uh, has his bachelor's from uh, UBC uh, in 1985. Um, so I will uh, embarrass him by, by reading him the citation uh, that, that we have uh, for him for this award. Uh, Dr. Michael Black has made pioneering contributions to computer vision, computer graphics, and machine learning, spanning topics that include optical flow, tracking articulated human motion, and modeling human shape and clothing. He is a recipient of the 2010 Kundering Prize for Fundamental Contributions in Computer Vision, the 2013 Hel Helmholtz Prize for work that has stood the test of time, um, and won two honorable mentions for the Mar Prize in, in 1999. 1999 and 2005, and uh, further multiple best paper awards. His work has been widely used in Hollywood films and has contributed to high impact public data sets. In 2013, he co founded Body Labs Incorporated to commercialize the research, uh, which was subsequently acquired by Amazon in 2017. So he's the, he's the founding director at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen, Germany, uh, where he leads the Perceiving Systems Department. And, and serves as managing director. Um, he's also a distinguished Amazon scholar and honorary professor at the University of Tübingen and adjunct professor at uh, Brown University. Uh, so so uh, due to my own incompetence, the, uh, the actual hardware for the award, it's still on its way here from elsewhere on, on the campus. So we will, we will save the, uh, the, the, uh, the actual handing over uh, uh, for the end and, um, and the photography then as well. In the meantime, please join me in giving a warm congratulations to Michael for the UBC Computer Science Alumni Research Award. So with no further ado, we'll give a more personalized introduction uh, next. <laughs> so, so it's a great pleasure to have Michael here. Uh, it was a good introduction. Michael has done lots of uh, fantastic work in computer vision. For sort of personally, my, my favorite contribution to the field has been the fact that Your PhD thesis. Uh, <laughs> uh, is the fact that Michael was my uh, PhD advisor as well as Franks, um, and so uh, I have learned pretty much everything I know about being an advisor, you know, researcher, and so on from from Michael. And so any of you who have taken courses with me or working with me are sort of uh, uh, Michael is your academic. Uh, I guess grandfather. Uh, so you're, you have uh, experienced him indirectly through uh, through me, and now it's great to actually have him here to experience him directly uh, giving a talk. So it's a great pleasure to have him here. Yeah. Thanks. Further note about my incompetence, I, I forgot to mention our, our sponsors for today, uh, one Cuban and, and PIMS. Uh, onwards. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for the kind introductions and for this honor. Uh, it's absolutely humbling, and it's, uh, I think it's one of the greatest pleasures of my academic career to receive this award and to be here and to see two of my former PhD students here as faculty having successful scientific careers. They're really, you know, you start out, your, you start out just wanting to graduate, and then uh, you, you think, oh, okay, I'm never gonna have to take a test again, that's great, but then you, you, know, then you move on to wanting to write your first paper, and that's uh, an exciting thing, and then uh, you write a lot of papers, and, and, and you have your first student, and, and now I really uh, enjoy seeing my students go on and have successful careers, uh, to see them build uh, their own groups. I mean, this is what really gives me a lot of pleasure. So it's a lot, it's absolutely delightful to be here. In this um, Hugh Dempster Pavilion, I think it's called, um, 
I don't know how many people actually knew Dempster, but he taught me programming, um, not in this building, in a crappy old building. Uh, and uh, he taught me PL1, I don't know how many people have ever heard of PL1, and COBOL. So those were the two, uh, my two big introductions to programming. I'll give you a, a, a little bit of an introduction, maybe to uh, my time at UBC, because it really f was formative for me. And then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work I've been doing uh, for many years now, which is um, starting to come together finally. So uh, what I'll tell you about is the work of many people working very hard. Uh, and I'll try and point out some of them along the way to you, and, and so you know the names and the faces. Um, but I'm the one standing up here, and behind me are all of, all of these folks. Now, I, just to give you a little history, I, uh, had, I'm an American. How did I end up at UBC? Well, I lived in Point Roberts, and I don't know how many people <laughs> know Point Roberts, but uh, there was, there's no school there. And so I went to high school in Canada. I commuted across the border every day to go to high school in Tawasson. And uh, so all of my friends and I applied for early admission uh, to UBC, and I got in. Uh, and then I got a letter from the registrar. I was a 17-year-old kid. I didn't know what a registrar was, and said, oh, we found out you're American. We have no uh, foreign student policy here, and we're going to have to deny your admission to UBC. <laughs> so uh, I, um, he's, and the, the letter said, if you want to you know, talk to the registrar, I'll make an appointment. So not knowing what a registrar was, I made an appointment. I went to this guy's office. It was the largest office I've ever been in in my life, so I knew he was important. <laughs> and I said to him, uh, you know, he said to me, kid, we're really sorry, um, but uh, we don't have any foreign student fees or anything. We, we just can't accept people from other countries unless they've gone to the highest level of education possible in their own country. And the US just doesn't count. <laughs> so I, I had no backup plan, so I started to leave his office. And he said, by the, by the way, can I ask you, how did you get yourself into this situation? And he said, I said, uh, well, I, I, I live in Point Roberts. And he went, oh, Point Roberts, why didn't you say so? I go down to the breakers on the weekend to drink beer. He got out from behind his enormous desk, patted me on the back, and said, welcome to UBC. <laughs> <laughs> and that year, I paid the same tuition as every other BC student. And the very next year, UBC instituted a foreign student fee. <laughs> And it's been going up ever since. And the UBC now makes a lot of money. And I really think it all has to do with me. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, I went to high school there. And I like to build things. Mostly, I like to build cars and, and, and cabinetry and stuff. Um, I, my high school guidance counselor told me after I took a test, they said, your ideal job is to be a car mechanic. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't really listen to them. But I did learn important lessons about being a foreigner in a, in a foreign land. And uh, it's one of the reasons I live in Germany today, I think, is I, was, I learned a lot. And then I, I, 1980 is when I first came to UBC. And I wanted to study, sci well, I wanted to be an architect, like lots of kids want to be. And I decided I would study psychology with a mix of math and physics for some odd reason. Um, but I, uh, I knew nothing about computers. I'd never programmed a computer. I'd never played a video game in my life. And um, computers weren't that popular in 1980. But I knew that architecture was going to go in this direction. People were going to start designing buildings with computers. And I thought, while I'm at UBC, I'm going to take one computer science class and learn something about it, because it's probably the future. Um, and I was really scared of this, though, just absolutely terrified. And, and so uh, through some bizarre circumstances, I ended up taking this Fortran programming course that was basically for forestry students. And it was not for majors at all. It did not qualify me to take any other computer science course. And, uh, but I learned to program on punch cards. Uh, and then I fell in love with it so much that I, I just dumped psychology and I said, I'm going all in for computer science. But because this course didn't give me any prerequisites for anything, I had to start at the very beginning. So I scoured the course catalog to see what is it that I can take that doesn't have a prerequisite. And it was the advanced courses. So <laughs> there was a course on combinatorial optimization, which was like a fourth year course. Uh, Jim Little was the TA of this course. And it was like, OK, I'll take that. Uh, and so I'm in there, and I have no idea what anyone's talking about. I barely know what an algorithm is. And I'm taking this course, and I'm struggling the whole time. Um, but fortunately, I had a good TA, and I got through it. And, uh, 
survive that. But I, I was so excited about architecture and computer science, I looked through the course catalog. Back then, there was no web pages, of course, so there were these booklets. I looked through the booklets, and there were tons of courses on computer architecture. And I thought, fantastic, <laughs> except <laughs> I had no idea that this is what they meant. Uh, but never mind. <laughs> Live and learn. Um, there was this guy here, a professor named Bill Havens, and Havens worked with Alan Mackworth. Probably most of you know Alan. And, uh, uh, and he taught a couple classes on computer vision. And back then, Havens and Mackworth wrote this program called MAPSI, which was about interpreting maps. And how did they do it? They did it using um, uh, uh, this sort of semantic network which is very much like what we would call a Bayesian network today, except there was no probabilities. And they did relaxation labeling, which was the form of belief propagation of the day. And this was my first computer vision program, was learning, um, was a program to understand maps, hand-drawn maps. And I totally fell in love with it and decided I wanted to do a PhD. So taking courses with, I took his graduate course as well. I also did a, a an internship with um, Paul Gilmore. He was a super advisor. And Akira Kanda, who probably nobody ever knows. He was a theoretician. Um, but the best thing I did during my PhD was uh, I, I married my, my wife. And that allowed me to actually get a job in Canada, uh, which was uh, <laughs> we got married for People always say, don't get married for immigration reasons. But I can highly recommend it. <laughs> anyway, it's worked out well for me. Um, so that's my brief history of my time at UBC. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I went on to other places. I did my master's at Stanford, and, and I kept thinking, you know, Stanford is this, this famous fancy place with all these fancy professors. But the education I got at UBC was every bit as good, and uh, I, really, I really believe that, and I'm very grateful for it. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about what interests me. Throughout my research career, I've been interested in things that move. Um, it could be the motion of a camera in the world, or it could be the motion of people or animals. But I've been interested in motion. And Aristotle said, to be ignorant of motion is to be ignorant of nature. So I really want to understand how uh, things move. And I'll talk about a piece of that today, not all of it, just the, the work that has to do with humans and, and their movement. So humans are, um, are uh, well, humans are about the most interesting thing around to me. The world is not that interesting until humans are in it. So if you take a, you know, if once we all leave this room, nothing's going to happen to it uh, until people come back in it. And it's, it, we manipulate the world and change it with our bodies, our hands, and we interact with each other and change each other's minds with our gestures, our faces, our communication. It's humans changing the world and interacting with it that I think is interesting. And computers kind of suck right now because they don't understand any of that. They're not full partners with us until they understand how we interact and how we interact with the world. So I really want to teach computers to see us, to see our behavior, see our expressions, understand what's behind them, the goals and the intent. So um, that's our goal, is to take images and things like this and uh, enables computers to understand what's going on in them. Um, and so I want to train computers to understand us, our interactions with each other, interactions with the world, our goals, emotions, drives, plans, etc. Now, human motion has been studied for a long time. And these famous uh, point light displays of uh, Johansson uh, have influenced a lot of people. And in, in his early work, Johansson wrote that the, the motion of the living body was represented by a few bright spots describing motions of the main joints, 10 to 12. This is um, what he thought might be enough. And th th this is adequate uh, that you can evoke a compelling impression of a human walking, running, dancing, etc. Now, the computer vision community took this concept of 10 to 12 joints and assumed etc. meant everything else. And I don't think it does. I think it meant Johansson thought of walking, running, dancing, and then ran out of other ideas and just wrote etc. Uh, because I don't think we can be reduced to the motion of just a few joints. So if I show you this, for example, now it's not in motion, clearly, but if I ask you the, the, the gender of this person, or their age, or whether you might know them, uh, or their emotional state, I think uh, it's a rather impoverished representation. So I think we need something richer than dots. 
Uh, skeletons is the next thing the computer vision community thinks about for representing the body and its motion. But these skeletons, they give a bit of an impression of 3D, but they're not really. And we live and exist and manipulate a 3D world. So I think the representation has to be 3D. This is something that Leon and I worked on uh, during his PhD thesis. Uh, Leon developed all kinds of techniques to, to extract 3D models of people from images. Uh, but at the beginning, we were working with these rather simple geometric primitives, so still um, somewhat crude. And the problem is we don't really look like this. And so I started thinking about, well, maybe the problem that computers are having in understanding us is that they don't really know what we look like. And this is what we look like. So maybe we could train a computer vision uh, algorithm to understand human motion if we had better models of how humans move. This is actually a synthetic model, one of our models called Dimple. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that, but the, this, this puts us into something that's slightly more realistic. So we had dots, then we had skeletons, and now we have 3D meshes of people. But you may know something, notice something a little odd about this. Uh, and that is that the face, well, you can't probably tell here, but it's, it's static and the hands are, are, are rigid. What we really want is something richer still. We want the motion of the body, the detailed motion of the hands, and the detailed motion of the face. And it's, with all of this, we can begin to understand how people are interacting with each other in the world. And, and so the, this was the true image. Um, and I think only this last representation really begins to capture something about this person. Um, and what they're doing. So with that introduction, my uh, sort of research theme at the moment is the following. We're going to use some very expensive and fancy techniques to get really good data uh, to describe how people move, how they look, uh, and then we'll build models of this. And we'll use those models to estimate human uh, movement from uh, out in the wild, from images, from video, from sparse markers, uh, inertial measurement units, et cetera. From this motion capture in the wild, we'll uh, learn and model how humans move and behave in natural settings, interacting with the world. We're going to create virtual humans that uh, live in virtual worlds and behave in ways that are indistinguishable from humans in similar scenes. And then we're going to use that to improve number two, and we're just going to keep repeating this thing. That's kind of the program we're on. And I'll take you through the pieces of this. Uh, the first part is building virtual humans. So uh, what's a virtual human? Well, th these are four virtual humans. Um, it's going to be a simple mathematical model of body shape. It should look real. Uh, it should move like a real person. It should interact with the virtual worlds like a real person. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to build that from some data. So I, I, I'm fortunate to have some good resources in Germany. And so we built the world's first four-dimensional body scanner. This has um, 66 cameras uh, arrayed around a person. There's stereo cameras and color cameras. And what it captures is a three-dimensional mesh of a person moving at 60 frames a second. <coughs> and with that, you're able to capture soft tissue motion, the motion of cloth, and, and so on. So that, that when we built this thing, it was um, uh, unique in the world. It was built for us by 3DMD. And so using data like that, we collect body scans of thousands of people of all kinds of different shapes, representing the population at large, and thousands of scans, actually hundreds of thousands of scans, of people in motion, all kinds of ages and uh, infirmities and, um, and so on, doing all kinds of things. And then the goal is going to be to train a model. It's a function, which is going to take in a, just a small number of parameters. Theta is going to be the pose of the body. Beta is going to be some small number of parameters describing the shape. Delta might describe uh, some dynamics. And A might, might be the appearance. But we're going to focus mostly on pose and shape, theta and beta here. And I want this model to be uh, very simple. And, and we'll see in just a minute what, what I mean by simple uh, so that it could be widely used. So the first step of that is something called mesh registration. And the problem is, once we each of these scans we take is uh, just a cloud of points, completely un, not registered with any other scan of any other person, including the same person. So the first step is to take a template mesh, the, um, the pink thing here, uh, which starts out as an average person in an average pose, and to bring it into correspondence with the scan, which is the blue thing here, 
and um, so that there's a tight fit. And then if we do put the pink thing in correspondence with every scan we've got, then the vertices of the pink things, of all the pink things, across all people should be in alignment. So the particular vertex on the nose on one person is the same vertex on another person. Now, we want to be able to do this at scale and fully automatically, and uh, that was years of work and not very glamorous, and I'm not going to tell you about it. Um, but uh, the final result is that we take these raw scans like this, uh, where nothing is in correspondence across time, and then we uh, align it using this, what we call four cap, uh, for four dimensional motion capture. And what it should look like is that these, uh, these grids on the body are, are, uh, are lined up. You see the soft tissue moving, um, but the, the 3D shape is consistent across time. So with that, we can take, um, in this case, we take a couple thousand uh, meshes, uh, these 3D meshes aligned to the scans per gender, um, something called the Caesar data set. We normalize them to the same pose, which is important. I won't tell you how we do it. Uh, and then we're going to do something very simple, <coughs> which is we're going to compute the mean of these people. And they're going to look pretty average because they're the mean. And then we're going to compute how the body deviates from the mean by doing principal component analysis. And what I'm visualizing here for you are the modes of variation in the population, in this case, the first few principal components of the female population. And um, just cycling this between uh, plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. For the male population, it looks pretty much the same. Um, variations in height and weight and body proportions. But these are all learned from scans of real people. So the, uh, this gives us a, um, the PCA space, uh, gives us the directions of variation, and then the variance along those directions gives us a very simple Gaussian probabilistic model for shape variation in the population. We also have a neutral model. I'm, I don't have the, a video of it, but we have a gender neutral model for when we don't know the gender of the person. Um, and, and then we have this pose training set, which is 1,800 registered meshes of, of people in a variety of poses. And given all that, we want to uh, learn a model. So what, is it, what does it mean? What's a model of the body? Well, I'm going to define this function m for you now. And there's a bunch of pieces to it. The first is we're going to have a template mesh. This is the uh, canonical shape of the body. We're going to learn uh, the topology is going to be fixed. So the mesh structure is going to be fixed. We're going to learn that shape. There's some what are called uh, blend weights. That's these color coding here. It says how much uh, each joint influences a particular vertex in the mesh uh, when the, the, uh, the body is uh, posed. So the body is broken up into a bunch of parts. Um, in a kinematic tree, and each part can undergo a relative rotation to the parent part above it. Um, and then the white dots here are the location of joints, and they're going to be a function of the, of the shape of the body, that is, of the vertices of the body, and we're going to learn that function. So uh, J or the, the T is the template mesh, J are the vertices, and W are the blend weights. Um, and then we're going to take those principal components of body shape, and those we're going to call those shape blend shapes. And as the shape of the body is changing here, you're going to notice that the little white dots are moving with it because we're going to have learned a function of where the joints are, no matter what body shape and size you are. Okay. Uh, then um, uh, there's going to be a, a function w, which is going to be given to us. And it's going to be a very simple function called linear blend skinning. You could choose other ones, but it's a common one in graphics. And it's going to take a template mesh, the joints, their locations in the template, uh, the pose, uh, the, the, the blend weights, and the pose of the body, and that's going to return vertices of the body in a new pose. So give me the pose of the body uh, theta here, and there's going to be uh, 72 numbers here, including the root joint, um, describing the rotation of the various body parts. Now, there's a problem with linear blend skinning, which is very commonly known. That is, if I take a, a mesh like this one on the left and I pose it, I get all these artifacts that just don't look right. So what people in Hollywood do is, um, as, is they see something like this. Spider-Man looks bad in the movie. And so then the artist goes in and by uh, manually creates displacements on the vertex on the left, like this, such that when you pump it through this W function, you get something that actually looks human on the right. 
So this is a, an artist design process of developing um, uh, pose dependent blend shapes. And our idea is to learn these uh, automatically from data. So what does that look like when we do that? We take all those um, training uh, poses and, uh, and try to learn deformations of the template as a function of the pose of the body that make the thing match the observed registered meshes that we've seen. So what you're seeing on the right is those the blend shapes being applied to the body as the person moves, and the thing on the left is a result of linear blend skinning with these post-dependent blend shapes. So that's the full model M. It now has, it takes in the pose and shape of the body, the simple linear blend skinning function, um, and uh, then the template mesh is now a, a function of, of shape and pose. There should be a little arrow here for that vector. And then the joints are a function of body shape, the blend weights, and the pose. And then we learn all of the parameters of this thing from the training data. And the result is something called simple, which is a skinned multi-person linear model. And we can change the body shape uh, and put the same, uh, put any body shape in any pose, basically, and have it look relatively uh, realistic. So that uh, takes us this far, but we're still missing things like the face and the hands. Uh, so we also have been working on that, and uh, we take exactly the same approach. And that the issue of why this is so important is that you know, we really communicate with our hands and we interact with the world with it. So we really need this. And all the previous models um, either had fists or like simple had these uh, flat hands. Now there's been a lot of work on hands, uh, and they tends to be focused uh, sort of close up on high, high quality, high resolution hands. But whenever we see hands actually in images or video, they're typically a small part of the body and occupy very few pixels. Uh, and we want to know, uh, we want to be able to estimate them. And for that, we need a good model, I believe. So what we did is, like with bodies, we collected thousands of hand scans from multiple subjects in a wide variety of poses, grasping all kinds of objects. And we did this alignment procedure as before uh, and got a training set from which we built a shape space for hand pose variation, uh, and we built a, uh, uh, a, a pose space uh, capturing the variety of poses of the hand and so on. So very much like what we did for the body uh, for the hand. And then we did the same thing for faces. And um, this I'll just uh, up ahead. So we have. Um, uh, we built a model called Flame. We did exactly the same thing. We captured four-dimensional scans of lots and lots of faces. Uh, we aligned our meshes to them. And then we learned a low-dimensional parametric model. Shape is captured by principal components again. And what you're seeing here is a comparison between a, the current existing model in the middle and our model on the right. You can use that to uh, fit faces and then transfer the performance of one character onto another character and so on. I'm not going to go into details of, of the flame model, but it's um, uh, available for research purposes. <coughs> now, that, uh, we then put it all together on a model of the body we call simple HF, or simple with hands and face. And this now, I think, begins to get where we want to be. We want to be able to capture uh, something expressive about people and what it is they're doing in the world. So. That's it for the body model. Now, the next part of this is can we use this to begin to understand what people are doing in images and, and video? So uh, this is a new work. It's unpublished results um, from a bunch of folks uh, shown here. And our goal is to be able to take something like a single image and estimate the 3D pose, shape, hand pose, expression of a person in the image. And uh, so this is a, it should be a realistic and rich description of what's going on. Now, you might say, okay, we've got all these great deep learning tools. Let's just train a neural network to go from image pixels directly to 3D pose and shape, the theta and beta parameters I, I mentioned. And, and that's a great idea, except uh, we don't have any training data like that. So deep learning techniques require lots of training data. And typically, we get that from, for example, human labeling the data. 
And humans can't tell me what the shape of this guy is or what 3D pose his right knee has or, or anything. So humans are really bad at this labeling task. So there isn't a lot of data for it. So the idea is to leverage 2D joints. So 2D, people can label. People can click. Where's the right knee? Where's the left elbow? And uh, including all the little facial feature points. And so this is easy for humans to label. And we can get good data. Uh, and there are several very good methods for estimating the 2D pose of the body from a single image. And we use the open pose method from CMD. Uh, open pose, people may have, maybe have seen it. It's actually quite impressive. It's quite robust. Uh, it does a reasonably good job of uh, getting uh, the major parts of the body, including some of the facial features in 2D. So uh, then we take what I will describe as a good old fashioned approach uh, to solving this problem. We call it simplified plus plus. It's a combination of a bottom-up and a top-down procedure. Uh, the CNN gives us bottom-up, very quick, uh, 2D pose detection of, of joint locations. And now we're going to bring our strong 3D model of the body, where we know all the statistics of body shape, and, and fit it to those in a top-down fashion. So a classic bottom-up, top-down approach. And uh, the way you would do that, the way we do that, is you have a, 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 a an error term, E here, which is a function, whoops, whoops, excuse me, uh, which is a function of the shape and pose of the body, some camera parameters, and we're given some estimated joints which come from the CNN. And now what we're going to do is, uh, is, is pay some penalty. We're going to take our, um, uh, the joints of our body, which is a function of beta, we're going to project them into the image with some camera parameters k. We're going to measure some distance to the observed uh, joint locations, uh, some, pay some robust penalty, sum this up, weight it by some confidence from the, uh, the joint detector, and also some um, weighting term, which has to do with different parts of the body. And that's going to give us some error. So the, remember, the joints are just a function of the shape and pose of the body. That's easy. And then the, uh, this loss function then is computing. We're, we're searching for our poses of the body that uh, when I project them into the image, these 2D joints match the, three, the, these 3D joints match the 2D joints that I found with my CNN. Yes? So that works sometimes. But it turns out that the mapping, of course, from 2D to 3D is fundamentally ambiguous. So here's a, a person, and here's their body fit to them. And from this view, everything looks good. But if I rotate it, you see it's sort of an implausible pose. Their legs are the wrong length, and, and uh, it's not actually what's going on in the scene. And it gets even worse than that. If you have no constraints on, the, on the, what the body shape could be, um, you can match the body perfectly to the 2D joints by producing all kinds of crazy monsters. So uh, to constrain this, we need to bring in some knowledge about the world. So we, I already told you we know something about human shape. These principal components describe uh, what are likely human shapes. So we can use that. Uh, we need to know something about gender, because gender is actually a big determiner of, of shape and also tells us a lot about the shape variation within a, um, within a group of people. We need to know something about body pose, and we're going to train a variational autoencoder. I'll tell you about that. Hand pose, facial expression, those come from the, the hand model and the plane model. And then interpenetration, which is a physical property of the world. Uh, um, my, uh, my hand can't interpenetrate my stomach unless something is really wrong. So the first piece of this is uh, gender classification. There's a lot of work on classifying faces uh, for gender, but not so much, oddly, on whole bodies. Uh, so we took a ResNet 18, which was pre-trained on ImageNet, and we, took, we labeled 50,000 uh, images with uh, gender, and we trained this thing, and we wanted to have um, uh, very few false uh, positives. So um, we set a threshold, and we get 62.4% correct gender classification, not so many incorrects, and then the rest are going to be neutral. We don't really care. Our neutral body model is, is not terrible, so it can uh, capture um, body shape pretty well. So here's this examples of successful male detections. Here are things we think are neuter, uh, and here are incorrect uh, male classifications, or, or some are female, some are male. 
Um, when it gets confused, it's, uh, it's actually kind of confusing. Now, it, it really does matter, because if I take an image like this, and I try to estimate um, this person's uh, shape and pose with the wrong gender, I, I may get the wrong result. Whereas with the neutral model, I get something that's pretty good. And with the male model, I get a fit that actually really captures this guy um, pretty well. So uh, the pose prior, uh, we, we want to learn what poses are, are natural human poses. And for that, we collected a data set of 50 hours of motion capture data. It's a data set of data sets. And we ran something called MOSH on it to estimate the poses, the simple pose parameters of our body model from mocap data. Uh, and then we took the pose of the body, which is, um, in this case, 69 joint rotations. So that turns out to be a 207-dimensional space. And we compress it down to a 32-dimensional latent space using this VAE. I'm not going to go into the details, except to say that it's important that uh, when we sample from this uh, latent space that we actually get out valid rotation matrices so we constrain that in the loss function. So that we penalize um, rotation matrices that are not valid rotation matrices. Then you can sample from this, um, from the latent space, and you get poses like this, which almost always look like uh, real human poses. So with that, uh, one more piece we need is this interpenetration term. And we thought, well, let's train a neural network to do a fast job of detecting whether two parts of the body are interpenetrating or not. It turns out that you can actually do this analytically um, very efficiently. And uh, if you implement it in CUDA yourself, then uh, you can do it fast. And it's differentiable. Um, and uh, so in some cases, this really helps. Like in the case of this uh, person sitting here, there's a lot of interpenetration. If you estimate their pose without a penalty, the interpenetration term just penalizes um, uh, these kinds of penetrations so you get a more natural pose of the body. And in this case, uh, though you probably can't see it, but this is not, this is the re result after removing interpenetration. It's not quite right because we don't really know about occlusion yet very well. So, yeah. if you get it, and if you don't have interpenetration, you get really ouch, painful kinds of things like your arms sticking through your chest. So that matters. Um, skip the numbers. Um, so how does this work? It's hard to compare. There are not a lot of other models like this out there. There's uh, one model from CMU called Adam, shown here. And uh, the, what I'm showing are a few images from what CMU calls the Panoptic Studio. And they have about more than 500 cameras, many HD cameras in this. And from this, they compute a, a point cloud of the 3D shape of uh, what they see in the scene. And then they fit this Adam model to it. So this is the result of fitting Adam to uh, more than the data from more than 500 images. Uh, this is our model, uh, simple HF, using the simplify approach, fit to one image. Um, and I think it does a pretty decent job of capturing uh, body shape. So I think you, can, you don't need 500 cameras to solve this problem, thankfully. Uh, and uh, we haven't uh, dealt with the video sequences yet, um, but we could. Once we start doing that, we can apply more constraints, like we could, the shape of this person's body should be consistent across time. It's actually pretty consistent without any constraints on it. Um, and this works relatively well on, on fairly unconstrained scenes. And you can see people enter. This is, whenever it's green, by the way, it's a gender neutral model. All of the beige ones uh, are um, the network, the gender network thought it knew the gender of the person. It's not always right. Uh, but we get hand-object interactions, um, I interesting poses. Uh, these are uh, from MS Coco, I think, all these uh, images. And uh, this takes about two minutes per person per image right now um, in PyTorch. We think we, we, think we can do that. So anyway, we're now made, a, I think, a big step towards getting detailed 3D human pose out of images, together with something expressive about the face. And uh, it doesn't always work. For example, in some of these cases, the, the, the low-level CNN uh, didn't detect that this foot belonged to this person. And of course, we can never recover from that. Uh, we're not, not dealing well with occlusion right now. We don't know really about these missing parts until we get the wrong pose. And uh, I suspect some of these were just failures of the, of the 2D. CNN. So next steps uh, is to get this, next steps 
but probably to train a deep neural network to do this end to end, which will s speed this up, extend it over time, deal better with occlusion. Uh, I want to add eye gaze in there, deal with multiple people and interactions between uh, bodies and contact and so on. So, um, so what's next? Uh, we have pretty decent models of the body and our ability to, ex to get them out of images now. The, um, I would say next is, there's a few missing pieces, which I'll tell you about in a second, but it's interaction, contact, uh, people with scenes and objects. So we, mo we focus mostly on adults. Um, we don't have a child model, but we have built now an infant model called SMILE for skinned multi-infant linear model. Um, babies, it turns out, are you know, adults. You bring them into the scanner, you pay them eight euros an hour, and they'll do what you want. Babies, you can't do that. So uh, to capture a baby model, we started with the adult. But of course, adults and babies are very different proportions. Um, and then we adapted that using RGBD data of uh, babies shot overhead. So you're seeing the, the 3D point cloud in the middle that we actually use as it's, it's pretty crummy training data, but given enough. Uh, scans like this, effectively scans of the baby. We're able to build a 3D shape model, uh, and um, we take the pose deformations just from the, from the adult. But it's uh, we're using this in a project with some doctors to evaluate cerebral palsy early in children. So apparently, if you very early detect cerebral palsy, you can affect its course, and you can detect it from uh, movement patterns of, of infants like this. Plus, I think it's really cute. Um, so the, uh, you may have noticed that all the bodies I've shown you so far are uh, minimally clothed. Now, most of us don't go around the world minimally clothed, um, and uh, so it, we probably want to have models of the body with uh, a little bit of richer structure. And so here's an example of our 4D scans of somebody um, uh, in our scanner wearing clothes. From this, uh, we had a SIGGRAPH paper uh, last year in which we automatically uh, segment the clothing from the body. Uh, we estimate the body shape underneath the clothing. Uh, we can do that quite accurately. And then we can strip the clothing off the person um, and then apply it, to a, apply it to a new person. So here we take this guy, we take his clothing, um, and then we put it on uh, a new character uh, who has a different body shape. So that's um, it's a, just a step. We have a lot more work to do here on making clothing realistic, being able to estimate it from images and so on. It's just a it's just a in the very early stages. Uh, but what's our what's our real goal? So I, I've been focusing on modeling the body and trying to get it out of images. But in some sense, I, it's not really what I care about. Um, what I care about, I often say to people that I think the computer vision is about understanding what isn't in the image. It's, it's inferring the story behind the image, not the sort of obvious stuff, not the stimulus response. It's uh, going beyond the pixels to, to figure out the backstory. And uh, to do that, bodies alone are not enough. Bodies interact in scenes um, with objects. They have goals, and the scene provides affordances um, that may satisfy those goals. And people take actions, and those actions have some cost. And we have to be able to, we've, we've only worked on the body's piece of this. But I think if we want to understand humans in, in images and video, we have to begin looking at all of these things, bodies and scenes and goals and forces and actions and costs. Uh, so we've begun a, a little bit of a step towards that. And in particular, we took our hand model uh, and, and um, looked at the problem of estimating not just 3D hand pose, but objects in the scene as well, and how hands and objects are interacting with us. So in this case, we trained a, a neural network, which is able to uh, take a single image as input and infer the 3D hand pose and the 3D object shape. And um, this is some joint work with uh, um, a couple of students, uh, postdoc and Ivan Laptev and Cordelia Schmidt. So the, the problem with this is that Estimating hand-object interaction is difficult because hands, by default, if they're interacting with objects, occlude the object, and the object 
almost always occludes part of the hand. So it makes the whole thing difficult if you try to estimate them independently. So we decided to estimate them together. Um, and we want to estimate, uh, we want to impose some physical constraints to make this possible. So we trained a two-stream uh, neural network. And I won't go into the details of it, but there's one stream that's trying to estimate objects, and the other's trying to estimate hand poses in the hand pose formulation. Um, and, uh, but there's a couple physical constraints that make this work out. And one of them is interpenetration. We don't want physically implausible solutions where the hand interpenetrates the object and vice versa. And also, if the fingers are, are, are close to the object, they're probably in contact with it because the fingers tend not to hover just near the surface of an object. So we want to um, encourage solutions that, that have uh, those two properties. So uh, this thing is still very preliminary. It's um, work that's just under submission. But we're getting to the point now where we can infer hands and objects together. Next step, of course, is to add in the whole body into this. And why do I want to do that? Well, uh, it's very common now that you see uh, computer graphic scenes that look like this. Um, really beautiful photorealistic scenes. You can look at an IKEA catalog. You see a lot of things that look like this. Uh, and there's, to me, the most distinguishing feature of, of these is that they never have people in them. Um, it's because people are just hard to render and, uh, and to render at this kind of realism. So I want to be able to add people to scenes like this um, and, uh, and have it look believable. So the problem in doing that is today the avatars I've created and shown you here are um, they couldn't be dumber. It's uh, some shape parameters and some pose parameters. But you and I are not a collection of shape and pose parameters. We have goals and emotions and needs and fears. And um, uh, these, these avatars don't see anything. They don't feel anything. They're not affected by gravity. Uh, they're just really not like us at all. And, um, uh, and so I think we really need to be able to uh, give avatars something a little bit more um, uh, higher level to control them. So I would like avatars that could go into this scene and sit on the sofa and watch TV, for example. Uh, that's kind of where we're headed. So my hypothesis is if we can capture, model, and render human behavior like that, so that I can render someone uh, going into this scene, sitting on the sofa, and watching TV in such a way that you can't distinguish this from uh, a real human doing that, then I have solved some part of the AI problem. That, uh, this is like a, a form of a Turing test, that uh, we must have understood something about human perception and human <coughs> So how might we ever get there? Well, where we're going with all of this automating human analysis in images and video is that I want a different function, not this M function that gives you a mesh out. Mesh isn't so interesting. I want a B function, a behavior function. Um, that given the goals of the agent, their history, the 3D scene, the other characters in the scene and their actions, produces some kind of speech and movement. And what I want to do is I want to fit our body models to every movie in Netflix uh, and take all of the, the scripts that go along with those things and use that to build this model. Right? So Frank laughs, but I have uh, not retired yet. I still have a few good years. Uh, now, the warning is this is an AI complete problem. I understand that. Um, but I think we can make progress on it in the next few years. So we're making little baby steps in connecting uh, speech and the body, because you know we don't just move based on these parameters of our body pose. Uh, we move our face, for example, uh, as we speak. So this is uh, some other new work that isn't published yet, where we take audio, uh, we take a, uh, oh, do I actually have audio here? I don't know if I can. Are those shy Eurasian footwear, cowboy chaps, or jolly earth-moving headgear? So the idea is we should be able to take any speech signal 
and any 3D shape and produce something that looks... Are those shy Eurasian footwear, cowboy chaps, or jolly earth-moving headgear? Uh, okay, and to do that, we, created, we collected a data set, again, of 4D scans of people talking. Cyclical programs will never compile. We experience distress and frustration obtaining our degrees. So one thing to notice here is people speak very, very differently. Masquerade parties tax one's imagination. They move their faces. The trip challenged me, but the quick step vanquished him. Very differently. That woman barely opens her mouth when she speaks. Top place top priority on getting his bike fixed. <laughs> the clumsy customer spills some expensive perfume. So we collected uh, hundreds of sequences like this of people saying all kinds of different things, lots of different subjects. And then we trained um, a model that takes the speech signals, does something fairly classical in terms of encoding them, and then trains a neural network that's conditioned on different speaking styles or different speakers, and then, uh, and then decodes this to produce a, a displacement to the underlying mesh. So we could take any mesh in a format and displace it in a way to produce um, speech patterns that are relatively realistic. And so just to give you an example, um, here are uh, the same sentence uh, said by, uh, with the same face, but with three, four different speaking styles. With tenure, Susie would have all the more pleasure for yachting. With tenure, Susie would have all the more pleasure for yachting. Now they all should look fairly believable to you. And uh, if I, uh, we did a perceptual study with people and they can, if I show them a, a person saying one thing, uh, people get the style right away. So I can show them these four styles and they'll say which one is most like, even though they're saying something different, most like the, the one before. So this is in no way cognitive whatsoever, but we're beginning to create our avatars such that they have other kinds of behavior and all, uh, as well. I think we can also turn this around and use it when fitting people to uh, video, now by combining audio and video. That's, that's on the horizon as well. So remaining challenges uh, are to, um, to try to get more of these realistic avatars out of images, including the clothing, hair, and so on. We need more realistic clothing models. Uh, you may notice none of our, our avatars have teeth, their eyes don't move, they don't have a tongue. It looks kind of creepy still. Uh, moving towards more photorealism uh, is something we would like. Uh, and for one, one reason is that it allows us to generate training data for neural networks. So um, I haven't talked about that today, but it's one of our efforts. I want to capture th people in 3D scenes together. I didn't talk about our work on, on image motion and 3D scene structure. Uh, we were separately working on that problem without any people present for reconstructing the 3D world. I want to put those two things together, uh, have multiple people interacting with each other, making contact, um, uh, have them interacting with the world and making contact. And I want to move more to the, towards high-level control of these, these agents and obviously capture movement in movies. So uh, with that, I'll say um, uh, people should come to Tübingen and visit. Uh, it's a beautiful medieval town in the south of uh, Germany. Weather's good. It's a little bit like California. It's like the California of Germany. Um, uh, it's not as good as California, but it's like the California of Germany. Um, <laughs> almost all of our code and data is online uh, here, and you're welcome to use that. We're always looking for good postdocs, uh, programmers, interns, researchers, students, etc. In addition, in Tubigin, uh, we've started an Amazon uh, facility. Uh, and my work there is with uh, Body Labs, which is the spin-off company that Amazon acquired in um, 2017. Uh, and uh, we've got all kinds of stuff growing, lots of stuff having to do with avatars and human motion and clothing and stuff. And we're hiring in Tubigin and in New York and in Seattle. Uh, if you're interested in any of those things, uh, shoot me an email. And uh, thanks for your attention, and thanks again for the honor. Thanks, Michael. I think we have time for questions. Yeah. So a few hundred years ago, artists like Michelangelo used to cut up dead bodies because they thought that to understand the surface, you had to understand what's inside. Right. So you chose not to model bones and muscles and tendons. Would you do better if you did? It's a terrific question. Uh, I have two answers for you. 
initially, our goal was to model what we could see. I don't know what's going on inside, and I don't, I don't know how your brain works. I don't know how you, you control your body. I, but I, can, I see the external, and I can model the statistics of that, and we decided, let's just push that as far as we can go. Other people were pushing physics-based models and more biologically plausible ones, mm -hmm. and they were going more slowly than this data-driven approach. Okay, data-driven approaches seem to work well. That said, I am interested in what's going on inside the body, and uh, we, I didn't describe these studies here, but we also do MRI scans of, of people. We bring them in the scanner, we have them move around, our 66 camera scanner, and we MRI them as well, so we know what's going on inside their body when they're lying down. So we use that to relate the outer surface of the body to the, particularly the subcutaneous and visceral fat. We're trying to help uh, diagnose um, issues where people have excess adipose tissue around their organs, which might um, be a danger for them without having to have an MRI. So, uh, and in terms of animals, we also do this um, same kind of modeling in, in rats and other animals. With rats, we also CT scan them and get the whole internal structure and internal organs. So I'm really interested in pushing that, um, but primarily with rodents at the moment. Just a quick comment. The person sitting next to David is the fellow who taught your combinatorial optimization course. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry I was such a bad student. <laughs> But I learned a lot. I still have my book. I still have my book. <laughs> Frank, um, to, to clarify why I was laughing, I, would, I, I too would like it if all of us spoke as if we were in the movies. Yeah. Okay. So that's all right. Okay. All right. Uh, the, could you just say a little bit more about the relative efficiency? It's, it's related to David's question and your answer to David's question. Can you say something a little bit more about the relative efficiency of using models such as those you developed in your pursuit of function. Yeah. Versus, uh, so what's the alternative? Um, the alternative is pixels in, um, ideas out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so lots so of people. It's a mediation. Do we mediate through a model? Or yeah. Do we have to mediate through a 3D model? And it's a, it's a really good question. And so why do I choose to do that? Um, uh, well, first of all, everybody else is doing the other thing. So, uh, but I, I think that our ability to very quickly um, add constraints here is super powerful. Um, the idea of the contact is important. Right. So I really think contact is really super important. And it's something that is, uh, if I have 3D models of things, it's very easy to enforce or to de detect. Uh, it's harder to do in images. And we've actually tried contact detectors of various kinds. And they're, they're hard to train. Um, the other thing is once you have 3D models, you can ask all kinds of other questions about them. So, uh, you know, Body Labs, one of the things we cared about is can I get your, your, your clothing size? You know, I watch you walk around for a little bit and now I got you, I size you for clothing. Um, you can, they, they're multi-purpose. You can repurpose them very quickly without having to get a whole lot of new training data. If I decide what's really important about you is your volume, well, I just compute the volume. I don't need any training data for that. Um, so there's some huge advantages to having these physical models. Um, plus, it's very then easy to repurpose them for animation tasks and, and other things. So they're, they're really multi-purpose. Now, whether it's the right way to, uh, to analyze Netflix videos to understand the emotional content or something, I, I don't know. But I want, I'll tell you what I want. This, this is not an Amazon thing, even though I'm 20%. This is, this is me. Not an Amazon thing. I, I'm interested in an Alexa that I can talk to that has a physical representation. Maybe I'm wearing VR glasses or AR glasses or something. Um, we've evolved to uh, communicate not just through speech but through our bodies. In fact, our bodies came before the speech. We were communicating long before we developed speech. And it is, I, I don't know why I'm making these things with my hands, but they seem to be important, and we all do it. Um, and I think our communications with computers will be more natural when they're like that. This is a path to getting avatars that, that I can interact with. It's not the only path. A purely pixel-based deep learning approach may, may beat this. Fine. Okay. We're working on that, too. <laughs> We've got to cover the bases. Yeah. 
that were predictable going to be coming from here, I guess. But I think what the, you know, did this last thing, what is the ground truth? I and mean, what is the goal? But first, I think about recovering the post from a photograph. There can be, as you said, multiple three poses with three yeah. Yeah. So are you aiming for the most likely one or for the ones that the person would be at the photograph? No, we're looking, we're, 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 it's a good question. We're, we're aiming at metric accuracy, and I didn't talk about, I skipped over what the one number slide, because uh, I didn't want to really explain it, but uh, we have 3D scans of people and photographs, single photographs of them. We try to estimate their shape and pose from a single photograph, and then we compare it with ground truth, full on 3D scan. Um, there's other work in which you compare it with uh, just the location of joints, but we can't see the joints, so, what's that? Do you think that's the right thing for measure? Because when people see photographs, mm -hmm. we interpret them, we don't always guess the ground. Right? Yeah. We know that the yeah. person yeah. sees is not a real photograph. No, it's a very good question. The question is, which one is also to be one? Yeah, for now, uh, metric accuracy is, is something you know, nice, because we can measure it by the definition. Um, uh, what do I really want? I, what I really want is the, the, the avatar Turing test. I want to be able to uh, simulate um, very simple scenarios of a, an avatar doing something in a room, um, picking up objects, interacting with them. And I want to motion capture a human doing exactly the same thing, render them both exactly the same, with the exact same technique, so there's no difference in visual quality. And I want it to be indistinguishable, which is real, which is, is human. And so that it will eventually be the perceptual test, but I'm not, we're not far enough along for that. Any other questions? Happy to have questions. Questions, questions, questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your hands work. You particularly said, uh, what, what it appeared to me was you're looking at uh, grasp shaping and how we interact with different objects. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm sorry, I skipped over it very quickly because it's, it's still brand new. Um, we, the first step of this is to create some training data. And we do that um, with a simulation program where we have a couple thousand objects and our hand model, which we then have automatically grasp the objects in many, many ways. Uh, we use this to generate, we then render um, synthetic images of the hand and the object against random backgrounds of different kinds. Uh, it's not super realistic, um, but that's, it's hard to get real data like this. And, and so that's what we use. And the results I showed you on real images, um, there's no sort of fine tuning on real images. It all comes from this synthetic. Uh, does that help? Yeah, I get, I get where it's at. I was, I was also hoping you'd give some idea on what you really want to see happen. In that uh, do you just want to see, okay, if, if a person's holding the object, how are they holding it, how do they approach it, or, or do you want to, for example, mix it with the way people are speaking? Um. Yeah, the, the first step is, uh, is I want to observe enough hand-object interactions in the world that I can learn the ways in which people grasp. And right now, we're very limited in our data capture of that. So in a mocap lab, I've got to put all kinds of markers on people. I've got to scan the objects and track them. So it's all really complicated. I want to be able to push that out into the world a bit. Uh, and um, so I can learn, that, you know, given an object, what are the ways people probably will grasp it. So I'm trying to push it into a natural natural environment. Right. So speaking about grasping, I think we actually have a hardware. Oh. Uh, <laughs> to so we, here at UBC, we believe in just-in-time delivery. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. So it's, like a, see, there you go. it's like a sheriff's badge or something. <laughs> it's, really, it's really very cool. Congratulations. Smile for the